you are looking at uh, the Science Teaching and Student Services building at uh, University of Minnesota. My, my goal today really is to provide a, a very honest portrayal, uh, sort of broad portrayal about what it means to, to teach in this space and what it means to learn in this space. And uh, the building was completed in 2010. It's now four years old. Uh, we have at, at present uh, 52,000 students on campus, about 31,000 undergraduates, 21,000 grad students. And if you look at the undergraduate population, uh, half of that undergraduate population takes at least one course in this building per, uh, per year. That's, it's actually about 49.7 or so that takes it in this building. Now, the building consists of uh, two auditoriums that seat 236 students, but also 14 active learning classrooms. So we, we make a claim of having the world's uh, strongest concentration of active learning classrooms in, uh, in, in a single building. We have three more on campus as well. So I, I think if, if things go very well here and you decide to build your own building, we, we just respectfully ask that you have no more than 13 in your, in your <laughs> building so that we can retain our, our world-class status here. Um, in terms of the active learning classrooms themselves, which are, again, we have 14 of those here, Wha over a third of the undergraduate population takes at least one course in those active learning classrooms per year. That is a tremendous number of students on campus. It's, it's quite impressive and um, uh, I, I've, I've been surprised from the beginning that that number has maintained it stayed the same over the years. The building replaced a, a very old building that had been there for a number of years and, and it was time for it to go. And uh, the university's strategic plan had talked about the importance of a distinctive undergraduate education. And this is one step in that direction. This is the inside, the, the first layer coming through the building. And uh, you, will, you will see that uh, from Mark Decker's presentation yesterday uh, that there's a, there's a flow, as you'll see the next slide, uh, there's a flow from this uh, informal space to the more formal spaces, uh, which are still quite informal, frankly. Um, in between classes, students fill up these spaces. Uh, you really can't find a seat, and, and that's just delightful for us. That's the Minneapolis skyline in the background. The Mississippi River is right underneath it, and it's, uh, again, a very large river that students love to, uh, to traverse and be around. We have a big bridge between that students see as they come across from the West Bank to see this beautiful science teaching and student services building. By the way, when I use the word active learning classrooms, I might slip into saying ALC, so I'll say ALCs a lot. and. Science teaching and student services, I may see S STSS over and over. So let's, let's take a look at what is happening inside these classrooms. And um, I want to invite you in to a, uh, uh, one of Mark's classes, the um, Foundations of Biology class. And um, we're going to sort of peer into there. And, and it, it reminds me of a of, uh, of the story of the discovery of the, of the, that uh, Howard Carter made in 1922 when he discovered the Tutankhamun uh, tomb in, in Egypt. He had a, uh, a colleague behind him as he sort of worked his way through and, and the, the colleague says, do you see anything? And, is, and the famous line from Howard Carter was, yes, wonderful things. And I think we're going to peer in and see these wonderful things happening uh, in this classroom. So this is about four minutes long. The room is one that when you walk into, you realize something different is going to happen here. When we have classes in an interactive learning space like this, it tends to be noisier than a typical lecture hall. Walking in, I think the thing that you see right off the bat that strikes you is a lot of big round tables that seat nine people. Each of the tables has their own link ups to a flat screen TV and we have mics at our tables. And at the same time, you have the PowerPoint or the slides on every computer all around the room. So it's this great space where like, technology and people interact to just create a completely unique learning experience. Instead of being in rows where students are facing a podium, students are facing one another. 
And so it forms a community as you come into this room and it facilitates both for students and for professors doing something different than what they've done before. The whole day is planned around what are the students going to do so that they can learn what I think they need to know about this topic. Learning concepts, learning how to apply concepts and so on, that's not typically done as well with me just talking and students absorbing knowledge. Um, it's really about practicing. It's about being able to demonstrate this and for students to demonstrate to each other what they know and what they don't know. You really get to know your team a lot over the course of the semester because you're sitting at your table with them and you're doing your class activities with them and we worked outside of class, we met up outside of class, we, we really just were friends by the end of the semester. In this class, your grade is going to be better if your whole group does better. And so you have a responsibility, just like we do in real life and just like we do in research laboratories and clinical situations. It's not an individual that's responsible for everything, it's the team. Once you get to a research university like this, we want to transition this from science courses being about memorization of facts and really about learning how to think. It never felt like instruction. It was, uh, it was more discussion. They would give a little bit of instruction behind it, but then they would ask questions. What would you do now? What do you think would be the next step? It made you have a lot more interaction with your professors than you might have otherwise, and they're really approachable. They're kind of just helping you with your activities, and a lot of times they're walking around the rooms, and you're asking them a lot of questions. So that was really nice to be able to just talk to your professors, but also have a kind of a different relationship with them because they're not lecturing you. It was them allowing us to figure it out for ourselves, but at the same time being there when we needed help to guide us. They really were more like colleagues in a sense, um, just colleagues that knew a heck of a lot more than you did. One of the major assignments that students work on during the whole entire semester is a project that starts with a proposal. So we ask them to identify a problem of social value and to solve that problem using genes. And they ultimately come to very interesting, very sophisticated, very important problems and viable solutions for it. It was one of the key things that I liked about this class, is you were learning without really knowing that you were learning. Students who say, you know, I learned how to, I learned how to ask questions and learn on my own and think about things. And that's what we really, are aiming for. That's what makes teaching fun. It makes teaching in this kind of space really fun. I am actually doing the kind of teaching that I have always wanted to do, where I'm really getting to see the, really, pure and simple, I get to see the light bulbs go on for students. At the end of it, I had learned so much about biology, about what it was to be a scientist, and about, I guess, myself in a way, of you know the things that I can achieve that I never thought that I could. You just think at the end of the semester, wow, I learned so much. So each time I, I watch this video, and I've watched it many times, uh, I'm regularly impressed with uh, the, the quality of the students that are, are part of this equality, the instructors. These are freshmen and sophomores. It's really impressive, but um, first year and second year students. But um, it seems that the room itself is making people, at least some people, rethink the craft of teaching. And in some sense, they're rethinking this along a couple of different roles that we have, and we all have these roles. One is that we certainly are transmitters of information. And uh, some people shy away from that, that, that term uh, when they talk about active learning classrooms. It's as though none of that is going on. In fact, it certainly goes on. It may go on for minutes at a time. I'll talk a uh, situation where it actually goes on for almost all of the period. So there's a way to balance that sense of our role as transmitters of, of information. But we are also designers of learning experiences. We design the environment, we design the activities. And we need to think of both of those roles as we're working our way through the active learning classrooms or any classroom, frankly. Now, buyers beware. <laughs> Buyer beware. If we're going to buy into the 
active learning classroom concept and what happens there, then uh, we, need to, we need to confront something. And that is that any learning space invites, it permits, it encourages, it entices <laughs> your involvement, but it doesn't cause learning. <laughs> Uh, it's not a cause, not a direct cause. That word cause is highly protected in academia for good reason. Uh, we should think real hard about things that are considered causal. Um, we say the room has affordances to them, and by affordances we're talking about a relation between the person and the environment and the activities in that environment. So the chairs you're in affords sitting. Uh, my pointer here affords pointing. My uh, a a pen affords writing. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it gets the possibilities of action that can go there, but it doesn't require that I use them in that fashion. Uh, I could just as easily throw this, I guess. <laughs> so I have all kinds of possibilities. I could probably throw a chair if I wanted to, but it actually encourages me to sit in. <laughs> so round tables afford interaction. They don't require interaction, as you'll see, but they afford it. They invite you. They permit you to do that. Some people even say that, that the kinds of uh, seats you're in now as you'll argue against interaction, but in fact we just had it over the last hour. It can happen. It doesn't happen in the same way that round tables invite us to do that. But again, the round tables invite it. Not everybody perceives those affordances or acts on those affordances, but the rooms possess them. And as, as my colleague Mark, uh, Mark uh, Decker has said uh, more than once, and I, I uh, fully agree, the most important technology is the round tables. Is the round tables. They invite this interaction. Uh, and right behind it <laughs> are the whiteboards. Um, I don't know how you, we actually rank those in some sense, but I would say that is they are, they are right there together. One can imagine and that some, some people talk about these as public thinking spaces, <laughs> a place to put in, in public your thoughts, your ideas. And um, I always sort of wonder, how far can we get in a classroom if for the most part we have mostly whiteboards around the room? Some of you, all of you who experienced Mark's class the other day uh, know what, what that leads to. Or if we only had round tables. What if we only had certain minimal things? What would that lead to? What would we get out of that? Can we get a lot of learning out of that alone? And is that a good step for us to take rather than having you know, the entire suite of things in front of us? Well, at Minnesota, we certainly built the building and we won't tear it down. That's a $70 million building. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to be tearing it down. We're going to use it, and we're going to use it very well. But there are many other classrooms that are certainly not equipped like that. Still, students are doing plenty of learning in those classrooms, maybe not as much as we want them to. So uh, what might happen if we add a few features to the environment that, that Mark and I and others think are actually quite powerful? So we say that ALCs, or active learning classrooms, are catalysts. They're catalysts or they're levers for instructional reform. Now think about that as, as if we think, well, what has that building done for the University of Minnesota? And, and one very simple answer is that it's made space. And it, it, it has helped us re realize that space does matter minimally. But in many ways, it gets faculty to talk about teaching. <laughs> I know that sounds sort of low level compared to the actual acts of being in the classroom, but we want people to talk about teaching. We want them to talk with their colleagues about teaching. And that kind of space does that. There's usually somebody in your department who's been teaching in these spaces. And again, we have more than just that SDSS building, but um, people begin to talk about teaching, and that's a great first step. Now, I, um, I had the good fortune last spring of spending 60 hours uh, in 12 different classes in the active learning classrooms. I certainly read the literature. I have staff that works in these spaces. You know, our staff, we have 18 in our Center for Teaching and Learning. They've taught in these spaces. We are, you know, we deliver a lot of workshops in these spaces. And, um, and I work in them uh, from the standpoint of workshops and other things. But uh, I really wanted to go inside and, and um, and sit and watch, and watch people who are not research subjects, who are not uh, participants in a research study, and, and uh, to see what they did, to see how they did it. And, and I asked if I could do that. Could I do that for two weeks of your class? 
And they all said yes. And this was across many different disciplines, so probably nine different disciplines in, the, in this observation. I actually saw 15 instructors because some of these classes were taught by two individuals. So I came in with a notebook and I, I just sort of wrote beginning, middle, end. <laughs> I made it really simple and very, in, many, in a qualitative sense, took a lot of notes about what happened. I sat in a corner and uh, I watched the students and I watched the instructor. And I didn't necessarily write down all phrases that people were saying. I just sort of tried to absorb what I wanted, what, what my eyes seemed to want to see over that period. I wrote them up into about 16 different insights. And, um, and for the purpose of this uh, presentation, I reduced it down to eight, and then I reduced it down to about four or five. <laughs> so uh, if you want to see the, hear the rest, you have to take me out to dinner tonight because we don't have a dinner reservation. Uh, or or, or, or come to Minnesota or something. You can come back to Minnesota if you'd like. So here are some of these insights, and they're, they're sort of broad and bigger, and I'll try to explain them as we go through them. So if I had to write the book on it, here's the kind of chapters I would write. The first, again, is, is one of the most, uh, is very important to hear. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a sense sometimes that these active learning classrooms are sort of magical places where once you get into them, wonderful things happen. And sometimes wonderful things happen. <laughs> uh, we have some very experienced faculty who, who make wonderful things happen in there. But the room affects people differently. There are people who are, who are only mildly affected by the room. They sort of do what they did anyway coming into that. And, uh, my, uh, and others are sort of moderately affected, and others really are truly transformed by it, sometimes by their first experience, sometimes it takes years for that to happen. My, my comment on this in general is that as we build the research literature on working in active learning classrooms, we have to be careful not to write all of our stories about those who are most strongly transformed by them. We have to write stories about those who are moderately transformed and we sure as heck got to understand how people are sort of almost unaffected by the spaces. This seems very obvious to some people and certainly this works in every environment, but as I watched more and more in these act, uh, active learning classrooms, the power of clarity became really evident to me. And by that, I don't just mean clear speaking voices or articulate voices. I'm talking about clarity from the standpoint of clarity in giving students directions of what to do next, procedures of what to do next, clarity in the way that they wrote their syllabus in very succinct, concise ways, clarity in the tasks they asked students to, perform, uh, to do. Um, there was a sense that students knew what to do next because the opposite of that was, were things that I noticed that the instructor would say a number of things and I'd hear that I'm sitting next to the students and the students would say, what does she want us to do again? And that was common. That's common. <laughs> that goes on in classrooms. We, we either don't hear people well. Classrooms are just a maze of misunderstandings. <laughs> you, really, you really don't know that till you get to the back and get a chance to watch students and see what they're doing. We're in front, we think people are probably understanding things we're talking about, but it's really interesting as you get behind and watch enormous number of misunderstandings that are going on. So really good teachers, clarity, uh, it drives the student's commitment. They become quite committed to the task at hand uh, when they sort of know what to do. It's really kind of simple, but it certainly works in the active learning classrooms. When I watch Mark and other folks who are teaching in the active learning classrooms now for years, uh, and this instructor, uh, proximity personalizes learning. Okay, it, it, it brings, you know, there's a lot of kinds of proximity here. It's, Proximity between the faculty member and the student, between students and one another, between students' access to a whiteboard, which is just a step or two away, their abili ability to see clearly the um, uh, flat screen monitors, which are very close to them in many ways. Proximity personalizes learning, and, I, and you, you, can, you only know that when you see the opposite again, and you start to see what happens when people do not take advantage of the proximity in that space. One of, the, uh, one of the real keys to, to solid, effective teaching is to give students something to do, as Sue Wick says <laughs> in, that, in, that, um, in the video. Tasks focus people's energy. Uh, and and you know, the heart of sound pedagogy is about helping students 
learn what to do next. What should they be doing next? And there are times to listen. It's important to listen and to be able to process and to reflect and many other kinds of engagement that are absolutely legitimate forms of engagement. And there's a time to act. And uh, in Mark's class and in, in a number of the classes in biology, there are, it is merely a matter of one task to the next. <laughs> in between, there's a short discussion period. Uh, there may be as much as a five-minute lecture. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> five-minute lecture, maybe two-minute lecture. Uh, I, I was in a class in education where the individual, uh, I think, never talked longer than about oh, 15, 20 seconds at a time. From then on, there were enormous numbers of, of, uh, of the time was spent students working with one another. Now, that fact, remember, is another example of a person who was unaffected by the space. Here's what I mean. He did that anyway before he came in. <laughs> this is what he did naturally in his environment in some other space. He was brought into this space, and it just sort of amplified what he was doing. But he really wasn't doing it much differently. Uh, he was able to, to, uh, to take advantage of the space in perhaps some slightly different ways. So it isn't always the case that people come in and have to do something really different than what they've been doing. Uh, he was able to do pretty much what he'd been doing before, and, and he was very task-focused. You know, it's about the academic task. What are we asking them to do, as Sue says? The neat thing about these spaces is that they give you options. There's a lot of options available. And the upper left-hand side there, this is a faculty member in um, engineering who um, is a very problem-focused instructor. So you can see he's working on the document camera. See up in, on the screens, so you see his hand in that corner up there. He's, he's writing out problems for students. And the students were tremendously engaged in these problems over the course of the 75 minutes that this class went. So here's a... Here's a problem-focused sort of uh, individual. The bottom left is uh, Robin Wright, uh, uh, Mark's, uh, uh, Mark's associate dean, and this is a very discussion-focused pedagogy. Okay, so you can see a, a, a very much one-to-one -one kind of thing, or one to, two, uh, one to uh, three or four individuals at a time. Same individual, you can barely see her, but on that third panel over there, you're looking at a, an ex a more experiential learning, a more... Uh, um, hands-on kind of learning pedagogy that, that occurs. And um, uh, in, in, in case you're wondering, <laughs> as you've figured out already, uh, the death of the lecture is greatly exaggerated <laughs> in, in uh, ALCs. They are definitely used. I've given you the, the situation in which a person can talk for as long as 75 minutes, but almost everybody, everybody that I've met talks in these spaces, and you expect faculty to talk uh, at, uh, one for one length of period or another, and probably our advice on this is to, is to do this in a way that, um, that doesn't happen at the cost of the doing aspect of, of what students should be, be carrying out. So believe me, I've been a teacher. I, I was a faculty member for about 20 years and taught well over 300 courses. Uh, and um, I was I was quite uh, enamored with lecturing and and was very very uh, comfortable in that space and lots of us are. But the active learning classrooms don't destroy or eliminate lecturing. It, it's going to go on and that and that doesn't mean it's evil or anything else. It's something we do. Remember, part of our role is the transmission of knowledge. We should feel fine about that. Feel proud about that. But uh, the question is: Is there is there a cost at all when it's going on too long. So it's greatly exaggerated. It happens, it will happen here, it will happen at any, any other university here in Sweden where you decide to build an active learning classroom, people talk if they're faculty members. <laughs> and uh, the question is how much we want to take advantage of that. Um, four ideas on professional development. My, my role at the Center for Teaching and Learning to direct that office is to work with faculty and teaching assistants to improve their teaching. Our, our role is professional development. So what kind of ideas do we have? The most common suggestion offered up by faculty and for faculty is to form these faculty learning communities, these communities of practice. Um, this is uh, an example of, of one of about the size of six or seven. Sometimes these communities are perhaps as small as about five or six, maybe as large as 10 or 12 or so. 
if you really want to learn how they work, uh, go to the website. J just, just type in faculty learning communities. You can probably get away with FLC, <laughs> and that'll probably bring it up. It will bring you to a site, I would guess, at Miami of Ohio. There's um, a person named Milt Cox who's been doing this for about 35 years. It's the primary, if not almost the only way, that they work with faculty at Miami of Ohio. Um, but uh, one of the things that that communities of practice do is, is uh, cause if I was running this community, uh, think of the activities you can do when you have a group of people together. Now you could meet monthly and talk about literature and talk about practice and that goes on for sure. Um, from my end, I would have uh, a fairly small group of individuals go to visit each other's classroom. I'd probably bring three or four of them at a time. Uh, hopefully they're teaching in a larger space so that they're not too uh, obvious where they're sitting, but I'd bring three or four of them at a time. Uh, that's Robin up there. If I was Robin, I would, I would bring my three or four faculty members with us. We'd go to visit another faculty member's uh, class. Uh, when it was all done, I would buy lunch and we'd <laughs> all go sit down and we would talk with a faculty member, uh, with my community member, about what happened to them and why he or she did what they did. And we would rotate ourselves around to other uh, individuals as well because observational learning is very powerful, uh, very powerful. Um, you almost don't have to tell faculty what to look at. <laughs> you, you could, and facilitators should, you know, we can help people sometimes if you say things like, let's just watch the, the kind of questions that faculty ask their students. And you know, there are systematic observation instruments that will let you do that. You can sit there and, and mark off who's being asked the question and, and, you know, the, and the kind of questions, the level of question. There's a lot of ways to do this. But if you just want sort of a feeling about what's happening in there, all you need to do is go to two, three, four, five other faculty members' uh, courses and just sit and watch. And the natural brain comparative process takes over. And you begin to think, wow, I, I could probably do some of that, or I would never do that. <laughs> and, and everything in between. And that's all good, it, because we don't watch each other enough. And the neat thing about these active learning classrooms and some of the pictures that, that Trish will show is that they are, we have made learning quite visible to people. There's a lot of glass out there right now. It used to be very rooms, well, we have plenty of rooms still where there's no way to get in, and faculty don't want you in there. Um, but in a community like this, that's an example of an activity you could do. Whatever the word problem means to you in your discipline, whatever the word issue might mean to you in your discipline, I, I urge you as a faculty member to become skilled with it. <laughs> become skilled with designing authentic problems, compelling problems for students. Uh, th there's something very powerful about your pedagogical growth when that happens. It makes you interested in learning. <laughs> It makes you interested in what students are doing and why they're doing. Remember, you're a problem setter. You don't want to be the problem solver in class. And in Mark's class, Mark just sort of pushes and prods people along. And once in a while, he'll say, wrong answer. <laughs> but most of the time, he's sort of pushing and prodding people along. And we're about problem setting. How can we set problems and design these compelling problems? And the funny thing is the act of doing that uh, induces pedagogical growth because it takes the focus off yourself. It makes you very curious and interested in learning and what's going on in front of you. It's a real skill to do that, and this is part of our, remember our, our role of trans transmission of information, but also designers of learning experiences. That's an example of a design we have to all become well-practiced at. If you're going to teach uh, a class of four or five people in some seminar, you probably don't need it, another person in there with you. But in some of these larger ALCs, uh, or even one of your first ones where, it's, where it is somewhat large, I, I would urge you to teach with another person. And, and here's why. In uh, one of our colleges, um, an award-winning teacher uh, had an opportunity to teach in an active learning classroom. And he'd never done this, and he's quite a good teacher, but had never taught in an active learning classroom. And he got very smart with, the, with his department chair. He said, I'm willing to do that, but I want my colleague to, to teach with me. Will, you know, will you let us do this? And the department chair said, great, you can do that. So they teach the course together. And uh, Mark's office does that quite a bit, but, but there's a very good reason for that. At the end of each day, 
uh, they go back to their offices, but they go back to one office for, oh, half an hour or maybe longer, and they talk. They talk about what happened, and uh, they talk about what they might do that differently that day or how they handled a question. And you have this person that I would call a critical friend. That's the person you want. You want a critical friend with you uh, who will come to your class and be part of your class and help, help you teach. And uh, uh, b besides the, the, the mere mechanics of having a very long space, Marx uh, talked about um, this, uh, these two 90-seat uh, uh, spaces that we pulled the wall off and now we have uh, actually 171 or 19 tables of nine. It is awkward uh, to teach in that space. It's very long, very narrow, but um, uh, just physically it's nice to have another person in that space. There's a lot of comfort with having another person in that space too. Remember, a lot of people don't teach in these spaces because they fear certain losses. They fear the, the loss of comfort, the loss of confidence, the loss of control, and I get it. <laughs> I do get it. Uh, being brought into a new environment imbruces lots of fear in people. And that other person in the room helps a great deal. And, and consider that. Consider that as one of the things. And, and you do it because, you know, I just had to have this, <laughs> this opportunity. When I got the picture of the um, anatomical theater, I said, there's got to be a way to work this into a slide. Because dissection by yourself Okay, it's difficult. It's really hard to be a good self self analytic self uh, analytically. Uh, it's most useful when there's somebody else, or your critical friend, an audience present, uh, to publicly say that that sort of public reflection. Um, there are lots of people that say I work better alone. I like figuring it out by myself. I, I hear it. I'm I'm quite an introverted person myself. I do my share of reflection on my own. I I kind of live in that world a little bit. But if I want feedback. I need somebody else. I need someone else to help me with that, and sometimes a group of people. The students do that through their evaluations every semester, but I usually want a colleague that will help me with that, and I want a critical friend. And uh, I think it's very difficult without that critical friend. Well, the last way, I talked about professional development, so some people say, oh, what does a professional de developer do telling people to just get in there? And I'm, I'm suggesting that people do that, and they do it very regularly. Just do it. Just get in there. Get in there and take advantage of what you already know. You're very skilled. Many of you are very skilled in, in teaching, and uh, you'll, you'll be adapting anyway what you're able to do. And lean on your critical friends because you will make errors. <laughs> you just will. So I... I urge people to, to find a way to just, you know, screw up your courage and get into it. <laughs> it's not easy. I mean, there are people that almost go running from it from the first day or so, but you have to kind of make yourself go through it. Trust yourself. Trust your capacities. You're probably quite a bit better than you think in these spaces. Um, and lean on your friends. Sometimes those critical friends, by the way, are not colleagues. They're actually people like our offices, <laughs> our professional development offices. In fact, more often, that's you know, what we see. We do a lot of one-to-one -one consultations with faculty. We did 2,000 consultations last year. And, th and they, they come and we become their critical friend, and that's what we get paid to do. <laughs> that's our role. One more thing. <laughs> when, um, when it's all said and done, uh, the big, it's biggest take-home message I probably would give is whoever does the work does the learning. Whoever does the work does the learning. In a lot of classes, the person who does the work, the most work, is the instructor. We do a lot of work for them. I, I get it. I did it for years. I know it. I still have to prepare. I did plenty of preparation for today's. And this is a little bit artificial because we're talking about active learning classrooms and here I am doing my role. But this is the nature of what I've been asked to do. But whoever does the work does the learning. And uh, consider, again, what kind of ratio do you want to have between the work you do as a faculty member? And some of that's a lot of that is behind the scenes, that designer role you have. How can I design things? And what are the things that ought to be happening in classrooms where you're taking on a slightly different role, maybe a radically different role? You know, you have to kind of evolve in that direction. It's very, very hard to make this immediate transformation. In fact, it's very unusual to have people make a, a rapid 180 degree transformation and start teaching in some other way. My strong suggestion is to feel the nudge of the room. <laughs> the room nudges you to do certain things. Um, the round tables n nudge us towards interaction. They, 
they permit it and and we should take advantage of that nudge okay. i guess i say talk here right thank you thanks very much <laughs>